So it looks like our participant count is kind of leveled off. So um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, yes, welcome to our first National Science Foundation Navigating the New Arctic Community event hosted by the NNA Community Office. My name is James Tempty. I'm a member of the Northern Cheyenne Tribe and director of the Alaska Pacific University Office of Research and Community Engagement and co-PI on the Navigating the New Arctic Community Office. Um, today, we're going to be discussing COVID pandemic guidance for field and community-based research. Um, but before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge all of the indigenous people across the Arctic. We are grateful for their past and present stewardship of the waters, plants, animals, and spiritual practices of the sacred place. I am joining you from the traditional homelands of the Dana Ina and Alaska's largest village, um, currently known as Anchorage. Um, I'm going to turn it over to the NNA Community Office Director, Matt Drunkenmiller, to provide a brief introduction um, of the office and our team. Thank you, James. And hello, everyone. I'm going to share slides here for my brief comments. I would like to give a, a very brief introduction to the NNA Community Office, which, as you may know, was established this past February. Navigating the New Arctic, or NNA, as one of NSF's big ideas, is supporting research projects to address challenges in the rapidly changing Arctic using a convergence research approach, which is defined as use-inspired, highly collaborative research that draws on information and expertise from across disciplines and knowledge systems to solve complex challenges. The Navigating the New Arctic Community Office fulfills part of this mission by building awareness, partnerships, opportunities, and resources for collaboration and equitable knowledge generation within, between, and beyond the research projects that are funded by the NNA initiative. The NNA Community Office is a distributed office across three locations at Alaska Pacific University, the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and the University of Colorado Boulder. We are actively working to support and uplift current efforts underway within the NNA community, which entails investigators, Arctic community members, indigenous knowledge holders, educators, decision makers, and international partners. We will also be developing a number of community events, listening sessions, workshops, and trainings to support the various interests and needs of the NNA community. This event is just one, albeit the first, in a series that we'll be developing over the years ahead using an approach that is informed by the NNA community, by our key partners, our indigenous and research advisory boards, and the NSF NNA working group. Our approach and planning will be structured along various strategic objectives. I won't go into these here, but these are available online. We have a central objective to uh, promote and, and demonstrate effective communication and coordination and learning across the NNA community. And we have four strategic objectives focused on co-production of knowledge, research convergence, education and outreach, and open science. Our approach is also informed by a set of guiding principles that we look to to orient our engagement and to remind us of the unique priorities and values that must be upheld within Arctic research. Again, these are available online if you, if you would like to take a look. My final slide is to give uh, the faces and names of those on our NNA Community Office Leadership Team. Most of us at this meeting are at this meeting today and look forward to working with you in the coming years to support your research and education and outreach goals. Lastly, uh, before I turn it back over to James, I want to acknowledge the NNA Community Office support from in close cooperation with, with NSF and, and specifically with the NSF NNA Working Group, 
We're very grateful that so many from NSF are able to join us today and for their help in putting this event together. So thank you again and, and back to you, James. Thanks, Matt. Today, we have a panel discussion followed by a time to break into smaller discussion groups to connect and learn from one another. For our first hour, we will be using Zoom webinar to allow us to more effectively record the presentation so that we can utilize the question and answer functions. Please feel free to use the chat function for the group chat and please reserve the Q&A tool for questions for the panelists. If someone asks a question, you can add to that question by upvoting it. The chat can also be used to extend comment or discussion about items in the Q&A. We may not be able to get to all the questions today, but we will keep, you, keep record of all the questions and do our best to follow up after the event with additional information on important questions that emerge. For our panel today, we are joined by Dr. Robert Anders, Director of the Alaska Native Medical Center and leading the State of Alaska COVID Rural Response Team. We're also joined by Dr. Frank Rack from the National Science Foundation Arctic Research and Support Logistics Section, Corey Erickson and Matt Irodanga of UIC Science, and Crystal Murphy from Battelle Arctic Research Operations. Dr. Anders will offer an update and guidance regarding the COVID pandemic in Alaska. Dr. Rack will speak primarily about the NSF National Science Foundation guidance and protocols that apply for researchers working in Alaska. Kari and Matt will offer a regional North Slope perspective and Crystal will speak about Battelle's role in providing logistics and guidance for research at the international level. Before we launch into the panel, we have a Zoom poll that will help us organize the breakout rooms for our second hour together. With this poll, we want to gauge interest in the four breakout group topics that we are proposing. One is research and com Arctic communities. Two, Alaska-based research and logistics. Three, international research. And four, discussions with National Science Foundation. Please select your top choice um, for the second hour with the breakout groups. We will be providing a separate Zoom link so that we can meet in breakout rooms. We'll coordinate the transition after the panel discussion and open up and open question and answer. For the panelists, we are recording the session. So we ask that you turn off your camera while you are not speaking. To begin the discussion, um, I'd like to ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves and the work they have been involved with um, in regards to COVID. Um, but please limit your initial remarks to between five and 10 minutes at the top. So we have time for questions and answer. Um, to begin the panel, um, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Bob Anders um, to provide a brief introduction. Thank you, James, uh, and I appreciate everyone being here today. Um, I'm uh, Bob Anders. I'm a physician by background, but primarily in an administrative role here in Anchorage with the Alaska Native Medical Center. Um, so uh, if you're not familiar, I think it's good to just give a, a brief overview of the tribal health system in Alaska. So uh, it's a composition of uh, 27 tribal health organizations across the state. Um, uh, I work for Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium, the largest tribal health organization in the United States. We provide here in Anchorage uh, tertiary care and statewide support um, to the uh, rest of the tribal health organizations in partnership with South Central Foundation, which is the local Anchorage-based uh, tribal health organization. We uh, jointly operate the Alaska Native Medical Center or the hospital and the clinics uh, associated with that. Related to COVID-19, uh, I think the tribal health system um, has been shown to be very well positioned and connected. Um, we're uh, separate organizations, but all affiliated and connected. Uh, so we had established communication channels at multiple levels uh, within the clinical directors, the pharmacy directors, tribal leaders from all the uh, tribal health organizations were well connected. 
And I, I think no one was prepared for all the challenges related to COVID-19, but as a healthcare organization and a healthcare system across the state of Alaska, I think we were well positioned to respond uh, well to it. From a history standpoint, uh, um, Alaska Native people uh, in rural Alaska has been disproportionately burdened by pandemics um, in the past. Uh, and as recent as uh, sometimes it's thought to be more 1918, 1919 and the Spanish flu that uh, really impact Alaska Natives. But even as recent as uh, 2008, nine with the H1N1 pandemic, Alaska Native people and American Indian people had four times higher uh, case counts, four times higher hospitalization and uh, critical care uh, rates, uh, as well as four times higher mortality. And what we knew from uh, previous pandemics, uh, the disproportional burden uh, of the pandemic was not uh, necessarily related to being Alaska Native people, it was related to a lot of the underlying uh, structural um, disparities uh, in the system, as well as uh, uh, kind of many of the social determinants of health. So uh, in rural Alaska and in many uh, tribal communities across uh, Alaska, access to adequate water and sewer is a challenge. Adequate housing is a challenge. So uh, overcrowded multi-generational multi housing uh, is common. Uh, access to healthcare can be challenging in many rural communities. And kind of a burden of a history of trauma and uh, systemic racism has left many Alaska Native people with a disproportional burden of chronic disease. Coming into the COVID pandemic, we knew that uh, those scenarios had not changed since H1N1, and we were um, very concerned about a, a disproportional burden of disease uh, and impact again. And we did see that as we were going into the, uh, particularly in Alaska, we were a little bit later than the rest of the country. But as we went into October, November, December, we were seeing those uh, similar disproportional burdens with uh, higher uh, and disproportional case counts, higher hospitalization rates, higher intensive care needs, uh, and higher mortality rates uh, with Alaska Native people with the COVID pandemic uh, um, having three to four times higher mortality rate um, uh, similar to the H1N1 pandemic. The current status, uh, the one thing that has been significantly different with this pandemic than previous pandemics is the vaccination uh, rollout. So I think at a, at a federal level, there was a critical decision to um, recognize tribes and their tribal health organizations as a, a unique jurisdiction for distribution of vaccine. So recognizing that unique federal to tribal relationship and distribution of vaccine was uh, critical. Similar, uh, use the analogy, uh, Department of Te Defense or the Veterans Affair also uh, get direct federal uh, vaccine allocations and not just through the state allocation. So that uh, on the federal level, they had what was called a so sovereign nation supplement, uh, a vaccine that came directly to tribal entities. Um, and with that afforded a lot of flexibility in local decision making. So essential tribal sovereignty in administration uh, of the vaccine and distribution of the vaccine that led to a, what I would say a very effective and efficient deployment of vaccine in rural Alaska. So since that deployment started in December and, and through currently, the vaccination rates in rural Alaska in particular have been uh, extremely high. I, I, as a healthcare provider, I think Alaska Native people in rural Alaska in general really see the value of preventative health care. Uh, when you have limited access to uh, health care uh, uh, providers of service in those areas, uh, prevention is key. And so with the vaccination, we've seen a significant decrease in case counts. Uh, off what we call off the road system or in rural Alaska. And that's for not just Alaska native people, but for all uh, Alaskans living in rural areas. Um, here on the road system uh, in Anchorage, uh, in uh, the Matsu Valley and, and in Fairbanks in particular, um, we are still seeing high case counts overall, uh, much higher than what we would like to see. Um, and vaccination uptake and percentage of vaccination has been lower in these communities than what we've seen in rural Alaska. I would like to finally note that, you know, in what I have seen for the tribal health system and in recognition of this disease um, 
in the pandemic is uh, tribal health organizations have been administering vaccines to everyone in their community, whether you're a tribal member or not, in recognition that um, the um, prevention uh, is uh, and the community connectedness of everyone in there really requires uh, kind of taking care of everyone together. And I think the tribes did an incredible job of doing that in Alaska. And so hopefully we're starting to see a little bit of benefit. We just need to increase here on the road system. So thank you and I'll end my uh, comments there. Thank you, Dr. Anders. Um, uh, with that, we'll turn it over to Dr. Frank Rack. Will you be sharing my slides? Yes, just I believe one, that, one moment. Yeah, great. So I just want to thank you for inviting me and, and to express NSF's thank to, thanks to the uh, scientific community and to all the contractors and support personnel who have been working diligently throughout the last, uh, you know, 15 months uh, that we've been dealing with, with COVID in, in various uh, venues and uh, for different activities. Um, I'm talking uh, specifically uh, for the program managers in the Arctic Research Support and Logistics Program uh, who are listed there on the bottom of this slide. Um, my personal responsibilities are for projects we field in Alaska and on vessels in the Arctic uh, Ocean and surrounding seas. Um, Jennifer Mercer uh, has been responsible for uh, Greenland. Uh, and we share responsibility for projects in Canada, Alaska, Scandinavia, other places around the Arctic. Um, next slide, please. An NSF's primary approach um, to Arctic fieldwork during the COVID uh, pandemic has been to facilitate uh, the execution of safe fieldwork where possible um, and also to ensure that uh, NSF projects are following uh, federal, state, local, and tribal laws, guidelines, um, both through the awards made to the institutions, the academic institutions uh, of awardees uh, and that are implemented by the PIs, as well as with the field support efforts that are being implemented through the Arctic Research Support and Logistics contract, which is uh, was awarded to Battelle Arctic uh, research operators who will be talking later. Uh, we just want to point out that institutions and their PIs have a shared responsibility for the execution of, of research awards, uh, and they need to provide sufficient oversight for the development, approval, and implementation of project field safety and personal protective plans, and to ensure that there's informed consent uh, regarding these plans prior to the start of field work. Um, we've provided many opportunities for the program managers to work with the, both the planners and the individual PIs or project participants to review plans and discuss options. Uh, and we've had uh, town halls and Arctic office hours that were hosted by IARPIC uh, in December and February. Uh, and we've tried to do other things to communicate uh, as clearly as possible, given changing conditions, what our procedures are and what expectations we have for, for the projects being implemented. Uh, the third thing is that PIs and other team members have shared responsibilities to understand the terms and conditions of their employment through their institutions, which include uh, an awareness of uh, the Department of Labor and Occupational so Safety and Health Administration directives and guidelines about workplace safety, as well as the uh, directives and guidance provided by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention and other sources of information about COVID 
and and this is as it applies to research and field work um and it's in alaska for the, at least the last year or more it's been providing a project specific field safety and and personal protective plans uh, next please and i just highlight that there's a lot of uh sources of information uh, available to PIs uh, about their awards and uh, the PAP, uh, PAPPG, the Proposal and Award Policy and Procedures Guide is one of them. There's NSF information and guidance that's been provided about COVID-19 uh, at, at the higher levels of NSF. There's also uh, links for information about terms and conditions of grants or cooperative agreements, whatever may be the case. Uh, next slide. And also to uh, the research terms and conditions of individual awards. Uh, and this is just uh, providing this just so you're, you have access to these links and, and can easily access this information. We were also, yeah, next slide's fine. We, we've also focused on ensuring that researchers follow uh, the principles uh, for conducting research in the Arctic, and these are developed by the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee, or IARPIC. And it's to be accountable, to, to communicate effectively, to respect indigenous knowledge and cultures, to build and sustain relationships, and to pursue responsible environmental stewardship. And so what does this mean in the context of developing protective plans for your project? Um, that focus on ensuring the safety of all your team members and others, uh, including communities during the COVID pandemic. Uh, as I noted, uh, the awards are made to institutions, not to individuals. So the institution should be involved in reviewing and approving a written comprehensive project protective plan that details the specific procedures and protocols that you're gonna put into practice to accomplish the field work. Uh, as well as, as I mentioned before, understanding the other regulations that are, are uh, regarding employment, which extend to field work. Uh, next slide. So to help with this process, uh, the Arctic Research Support and Logistics Program put out uh, some guidance in March the 24th of 2021. Um, that gave our position and provided some links. And I'll just highlight some of the aspects of this, um, that we're committed to protecting the health of program participants and also preventing the spread of COVID-19 to the Arctic uh, communities and research stations. And we've worked with our partners and PIs and a lot of other uh, groups and individuals to try to enhance this uh, objective. Uh, we're also working to uh, plan and implement strategies as evidence and science-based public health guidelines uh, become available and, and evolve through time. Uh, and that's in keeping with state, local, tribal, and other guidelines regarding uh, travel and, and work in the Arctic communities. Uh, next slide. So part of this includes following uh, the changes in travel restrictions, testing requirements. Um, and at some times the field work may be impractical because of the, the nature of the field work or the timing or the local conditions. Um, and we really have been stressing informed consent, communicating with local and tribal uh, communities and governments uh, and, and understanding the, the situational awareness uh, on the ground. Uh, we've worked with the University of Alaska in Fairbanks and the uh, Institute for Arctic Biology who manage uh, the Tulik Field Station through a cooperative agreement. We've also worked with UIC Science uh, and others uh, on protocols and procedures in Alaska uh, and in Okiavik or in places in, in Greenland like Summit. Uh, and really looking at the reality of uh, what kind of field work can be supported, what are the limitations, what are the things that we need to do to facilitate that. Uh, and we've tried to keep the communication open 
uh, for all these different discussions. Uh, next slide, please. So back in March, we, we identified that field work can be supported. There may be some limitations um, and there are definitely protocols uh, and procedures. And you'll hear some more of that from the Battelle Arctic uh, operators. Um, and we've kind of provided links to online information for both Alaska and other field uh, locations. Uh, next slide, please. And I've listed some of these here, and they change frequently. The Alaska Health Advisories were changed just this week. Uh, and there's a lot of information online, both from CDC and from the COVID Information Hub in Alaska. And you can look at those sites to see. Uh, next slide. What I really want to focus on is the, the scientific evidence that we use to create our protocols. And here, this is from the CDC. Uh, science brief, the most recent one available. And it shows that you have to look at the type of vaccine and its efficacy, uh, as well as the point of where you're traveling from and where you're traveling to. And as of today, uh, the total population in Alaska is about 34% fully vaccinated. Uh, the population over 18 that's fully vaccinated is about 45%. Most of the places in the lower 48 are on the order of 25 to 35% of the total population and maybe up to 40% of the population below 18, over 18. So you're still in this kind of light blue area of 40 to 60% uh, overall to establish what is the, uh, the risk uh, and the potential for risk reduction. Uh, next slide. And this is really, uh, again, from the CDC, this is a table that really provides, um, you know, some, some guidance about, in addition to vaccines, what other tools do you have? And that's the pre-test, pre-travel testing, post-travel testing, and the quarantine period. Uh, and what I'm just showing here and trying to demonstrate is that even with vaccines, uh, you still have a significant risk. And it's really the combination of things, including the pre and post travel um, testing and a, a quarantine period that get you into that 90% or higher level that we're really looking uh, to ensure safety. Uh, next slide. And these other sources of information are the COVID data tracker, and they, you could find a lot of information here about vaccination uh, in each state uh, and for different kinds of vaccines. Next slide. And you can also see the statistics and drill down uh, to the data that's available. I, uh, I, next slide, please. I, I downloaded this data this morning to find the statistics on, on vaccination. And you can also sign up for the the Alaska COVID Daily Summary, which provide information about caseloads, hospitalizations, and give you a more detailed uh, view throughout the, uh, the state. Next slide. And there's a hub for Alaska uh, information that you can look at, and this provides links to the, the boroughs and community websites and other information uh, and other information other uh, mapping tools. Next slide. And I just wanted to focus on this also shows you where testing sites are located. And you can see that along the North Slope, it's, it's really Ipyavik or Fairbanks. And a lot of the other locations are, have limited cap capabilities. Uh, and so that you need to factor that into your plan. Next slide. Now I'll just finish with this uh, guidance from uh, UnAlaska. We have a cruise that's going in, in May on the Sekuliak from, from Unalaska Dutch Harbor. And because of an incident that happened a, a couple of weeks ago, they went from a medium to a high risk level and the uh, protocols in place were elevated. Uh, so it, it changes day to day and you really have to stay alert and uh, and increase your awareness of the, the situation on the ground at any particular moment as you're planning your field work. 
And I'll, I'll end here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rack. Um, that was very informative. Um, we did have a question real quick, and I'll just answer because I'm sure many of you are um, wondering this, but we will provide copies of the slides um, after today's presentation. So um, yeah, with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Corey Erickson and Matt Hiranaga from the UIC Science. Yeah, hi. Um, can you uh, hear me all right? Okay. Yes, thank you. Great. Uh, my name is Matt Irinaga. I'm the uh, UIC Science uh, HSE Specialist. Um, unfortunately, uh, Corey uh, can't make the meeting today, so uh, it's just going to be me. Um, so with that, um, I'll just briefly give an overview of, of uh, what's going on in Upjavik right now. Um, and uh, certainly be available for questions. So um, uh, anyway, as Frank mentioned, um, UIC Science is a partner on the Battelle ARO support contract with NSF. So uh, working with our partners uh, under the guidance of NSF, we've come up with a, uh, mitigation strategies for people to come to Upjavik and conduct their field work uh, in a safe and efficient manner. Um, currently, we do have a couple groups uh, in, in Barrow that have gone through our um, quarantine protocols, uh, testing, and are now successfully working in the field. So uh, this has all happened in the last couple of weeks. So we've had some success uh, already in the spring season. Um, in addition to the uh, NSF uh, guidelines that we're, we are following, we're also abiding by any state, uh, city, and borough um, health orders or advisories. Um, and just recently, uh, as of last week, on the 22nd of April, the city of Barrow, uh, Ukiavik, uh, implemented a, a new ordinance requesting Anyone coming to uh, Ukjavik um, who has not been vaccinated uh, to undergo a self quarantine. So we're uh, reviewing that and notifying groups that uh, come, come to uh, Ukjavik uh, that uh, the language is, uh, is verbatim. It's uh, highly recommended or strongly recommended uh, that you undergo a, um, a self quarantine. Now that doesn't affect the NSF group so much because they're already um, uh, undergoing a quarantine requirement, um, whether it's in, in Ukjavik or just uh, in either the hub cities of Fairbanks or Anchorage um, to do their quarantine. Um, so we are, we are working on that. So anyway, um, we are abiding by NSF uh, uh, requirements and also state, city, and the borough requirements as well. So our challenge that we're finding is that we've got basically two, two groups uh, of researchers that are coming to Ukiavik to conduct their field work, um, some funded by the NSF under the ARCELIS uh, program, and then uh, other groups that are either self-funded with their own institution uh, or international groups. So we are trying to balance that. Um, in response to that, we have come up with different mitigation plans for both sets of people, essentially. And we have different housing available, uh, depending on which, uh, where you fit in that uh, under your funding. And so we do have some segregation of groups, uh, depending on their uh, funding source. Uh, housing is a challenge in, in Utiavik, uh, but we are able to secure um, two different facilities uh, that can accommodate. Uh, one has 26 beds, the other one has 39 beds, I believe. So uh, when we hit peak population, I, I think we're fairly confident that we should be able to accommodate uh, everyone who's scheduled to uh, to come to uh, Uktiavik this uh, spring and summer. Uh, in addition to the housing, uh, we also have secured um, an isolation facility, uh, which is essentially a house uh, should someone test positive uh, while they're on the ground in Ukiavik as well. So uh, that's uh, part of our, our mitigation plan. If, if someone does test positive 
while they're in Barrow, uh, we do have a place to, to accommodate uh, that person or their entire group for that matter. Um, let's see here. Um, as far as other, other things about Bukiavik right now, um, we had a meeting with our staff this morning and I, I asked our crew, um, you know, what the general atmosphere is there. And right now, uh, this is probably the most important time of the year in, in, in Ukiavik because it's the height of spring whaling. And uh, there's crews out on the sea ice uh, in their undergoing their subsistence activities. Um, it's a really exciting time of year. People are very anxious. Uh, and the atmosphere in general is a lot of positivity. Uh, there's uh, things are moving towards normalcy. Uh, I can't give you exact numbers on vaccination rates, but it's fairly high. I wanna say it's over 40%. Um, I was looking at the hospital report for the day and uh, case, I think there was one, one positive case that came up just recently. So it's things like, it seems like things have stabilized in, in the community itself of uh, Ukiavik. Um, another barometer of the uh, atmosphere in the community is uh, uh, one, one of our team members said, uh, bingo, bingo is going to start up. So, you know, that's kind of a big deal in a community of a lot of elders. Uh, uh, who want to uh, get out and, and do something other than being housebound all the time. So I think uh, the overall message is that we are doing our best to uh, mitigate any issues that uh, uh, COVID may present. And I think the community is um, welcoming researchers uh, back to Barrow. And uh, we're just trying to do our best to uh, keep everyone safe, keep our community safe and uh, allow people to have a successful field season. So that's it. <laughs> Great. Thank you for that, Matt. Um, yeah. Now we'll turn it over to Crystal Murphy from Battelle Arctic Research Operations. Hey, thank you very much. And um, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you happen to be. Um, I am Crystal Murphy. I'm the Battelle um, Arctic Research Operations Health, Safety, and Environment Manager. And I'll say the emphasis there is on Battelle, and um, that'll become clear in just a couple seconds. Um, my background is in public health and industrial hygiene, which is a, a specialized subset of public health. Um, Battelle became the new prime contractor on the Arctic Research Support, excuse me, logistic service contract um, in the summer of 2020. We began the transition in July, um, which is when I joined the team and formally, be formally became the prime in September. Um, I'm gonna go a little bit on a limb and describe Aero as a conglomerate. Again, that's my word, conglomerate, that's if you, are into corporate structures, that's probably not the exactly appropriate term. We do have several partners. You, you just heard my colleague, Matt, at UIC Science. They're one of our partners. Um, several of you have probably dealt with Polar Field Services. They're, they are also on the team. Um, and so probably really great for, for most of you that those two remain the same, uh, even though the prime changed. Uh, CU Anschutz, the CU School of Medicine, um, is our, provides our medical advice. They also provide telemedicine, including telemental health uh, for those going to the field. So I'm gonna put a plug in for that. Um, with the kickoff of this season, you have an option to create a um, UC Health electronic medical record so that the folks you might call can actually look at your medical history um, and provide you really good advice and then document your care in a medical record that you can then transfer back to your primary care provider. So that's three of our five, I'm almost done. Uh, the fourth is Stantec, a, a very experienced environmental construction firm. And then uh, hopefully in a couple minutes, I will show you the Battelle Arctic Gateway. And that is a product of our final partner, the San Diego State Supercomputing Center. 
So as you gathered, I'm just one member of a team of HSC professionals. You just met Matt. Um, each of our partners works on various aspects of health safety environment and, and the logistics program. So my role as the HSE manager for Battelle with regard to COVID has really been data fusion um, and trying to take all that information you saw in Frank's slides and boil that down to a risk assessment um, and a risk reduction effort. So it involves researching, trying to stay up to date on the pandemic's progression and development, the different regulations and advisories are out there the available technology and emerging science, which has just been growing at a tremendous rate, um, and then provide advice to NSF and assist them in developing practices and procedures to get everybody to the field safely and back home. We also just wrapped a really robust emergency planning effort, um, specifically to come up with a disease containment plan for each of our major operating sites. So I'll spend just a few minutes talking about um, the international situation. And I'll talk first from the perspective of the US and its assessments and requirements. And then from the perspective of some of the other countries and their assessments and requirements. And then I'll wrap up with some Greenland specific information. From the perspective of the United States, the CDC has rated Canada, the Schengen countries, including Norway and Russia, as COVID-19 risk level four or very high. So because of that current situation, um, there's, their guidance is that even fully vaccinated travelers may be at risk for getting and spreading the COVID-19, especially its variants, and should just avoid all travel. So accordingly, the US Department of State issued a parallel do not travel order for all those regions. Um, in contrast though, Greenland CDC has rated level one or COVID-19 risk as low. If you go to look at whether or not the state has published an analogous um, declaration, you won't find it. State right now doesn't distinguish between Denmark and Greenland on their travel page. If you get into the consular pages, you'll see some difference, differentiation and some different guidance for Greenland. Um, so what does that all mean? Um, CDC's risk rating is based on incidence rate. So that they are looking at cases for the last 28 days per 100,000 population. So when you look at those, that's what that's getting at is really over the last month, how many new cases have developed it's probably important to note too, um, switching now to the US, uh, excuse me, I'm on the US, but switching to a little bit different flavor, um, to re-enter the United States after travel abroad, travelers must present proof of a negative COVID-19 test to their airline. Um, the test can be no older than three days prior to the flight boarding. Um, travelers who are citizens from Countries other than the United States, several of them are just barred from entry, except for some very limited exceptions, such as medical care. Okay, so now switching to the perspective of some of the other countries, Canada is only allowing essential travel through its territories and its waters. Um, so that's actually a pretty strict definition of what is considered essential. So for example, visiting property you own in Canada is not considered essential. Um, so again, it's things like medical treatment and critical infrastructure work for which you can gain entry to Canada. Um, if you are allowed entry, Canada requires testing and quarantine regardless of vaccination status. The government of the Russian Federation, Norway and Denmark have just pretty much closed their borders. So they have banned entry um, to all foreign nationals, again, with some similar exceptions, medical care being one of them. So Greenland has also closed their borders, but um, they are allowing entry by special permission, um, which has been specifically negotiated by NSF and is pretty much limited to military airlift flights. Um, that, was, that was part of the agreement. Greenland is jealously guarding its low 
um, case counts. So they've only had 31 total cases during the outbreak. Their per capita rate of infection is 54.6 per 100,000 people. So you can tell now that uh, since the total case number is lower than the incidence rate, that there's an extrapolation for the low population numbers. If you contrast that to Alaska, 54 per 100,000, Alaska is 9,272 per 100,000. Iceland is about 1,800. And Newfoundland and Labrador are probably the closest at 204. So Greenland's done a, a remarkable job. Um, and then also do their remote list. They've remained um, much less affected by the pandemic than a lot of other countries. And they would very much like to keep it that way. So to go there via military airlift, there's really a three part quarantine involved in that. Um, starting with strict social distancing at home, followed by a quarantine in New York and a quarantine upon arrival in, in Greenland and then up to four um, COVID tests. And in addition, pretty much our, our researchers and our employees have to remain separate from the community the entire time they're there. And if I can successfully share my screen, I'll give you a look at the Battelle Arctic Gateway. And hopefully you have found this already. And James or Matt, if you can just give me an acknowledgement that you can see it, that'd be great. Yes, I can see it. Thank you. So along the top, you can see two different tabs that will take you to the same place. So COVID-19 actually takes you to the HSC page. And a couple things to highlight here uh, that may not be completely self-explanatory when you look at it is this is a drop-down menu that will take you to the protocol for your specific location. So I will select Bukiavik as an example. And if somebody could just acknowledge that I actually selected the right screen share and you followed me through that transition, that would be awesome. Yes, it worked, Crystal. Okay, thank you. Um, so the documents contain link, several links and we've done our best to lay these out in chronological order. But the few that I wanna highlight here are links to clearing houses, which will tell you where those testing sites are. So one of these is housed by a CDC and one is housed actually by um, a laboratory consortium. And then specifically for Ukiavik, I wanna point out that um, when when you clear quarantine in Ukiavik, um, there is a you will get tested at Samuel Simmons Memorial Hospital. So there's a link there too to go pre-register for your test. I will stop sharing, and um, I think that's a wrap of my comments. So again, thank you for the opportunity, and it's great to see everybody. Thank you, Crystal. Um, we are running a little short on time, but I think we have um, time for just a couple questions um, from any of the participants. Um, it looks like uh, Dantella Zana has uh, raised her hand. If uh, um, Chantel, are you able to um, say your question? Let me just see. Or possibly put it in the Q&A, um, that would help. Um, we did have a question from Noah Ashley and his question is, why is the quarantine in Barrow 10 days instead of seven as shown in Dr. Rack's slides? It would be useful to know Barrow's vaccination rate to con conform to the CDC data. Um, yeah, so so there's, I mean, this what I showed in CDC was was an example. I mean, that a seven day quarantine is within the uh, the range. Um, we've had over the past year, you know, fourteen day quarantine was the, the gold standard. 
we've we've moved it to 10 based on evidence um, and working with the community of Utkiavik and UIC science, uh, the 10 day uh, was determined to be the best length, uh, really because with these different variants, even if you're vaccinated, you, after travel, you may not show um, a positive test until five to seven days. And then with the turnaround time for the test results, 10 days is a, a reasonable period. We, we're continuing to evaluate this as time goes on and the percentages of people that are vaccinated in the population increase. But um, but that's been the the kind of rationale at up to this point. Thanks, Frank. And I think Donna, if uh, you hi, want. yes, yeah. thank you, thank you very much. So uh, I was uh, I know that this is very delicate, and I'm uh, really appreciative of uh, uh, all the effort that NSF is doing, but. I was wondering if it's possible to involve the community into a discussion of uh, uh, waiving the quarantine order for the people that are vaccinated, because from the slide you showed, uh, there is written actually no quarantine required in the quarantine order of the state of Alaska, no quarantine uh, required for travelers that are fully vaccinated at least 14 days uh, prior to the date of travel. I know it, uh, it's be, better be careful uh, than uh, given all the variants of everything, but maybe we can involve the community into a discussion. Uh, as you say, things are evolving very quickly. And maybe if the community uh, um, agrees with this, given the CDC is actually supporting the, uh, the, that there is no need for a quarantine for vaccinated people. I'm hoping that maybe how things are getting better with the progression of the summer. We have another like maybe people that are traveling later, mid summer of uh, when maybe more people are vaccinated. Anything, if you guys are open to a discussion to uh, possibly relax some of these uh, um, uh, requirements for vaccinated people. Yeah, Donatella, I mean, I'll address that. At, at this point, the, the policy of NSF is the vaccination status is not a consideration in, in the development and the modification of our protocols. Because as I showed in that slide, it's both the originating, uh, you know, where you're traveling from, where you're traveling to, and um, we can't, and if you saw the governor's uh, statement uh, earlier this week, it, there are no pass vaccination passports, and we can't request that information. Um, so it makes it very um, difficult to create policy uh, that's based on our scientific evidence when that information isn't available to us. Thanks, Frank. Um, Can I add a little something, James? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I know uh, I can't speak to NSF's policies, but I'll, I'll just comment on the current state in Alaska. Um, so Nome and Dillingham have changed. And I know the governor has come out with some uh, a, a, an administrative order related to vaccine passport, but he does, uh, and I think the state of Alaska really respect local decision making. So uh, what Nome and Dillingham have done based on vaccination status, and those are the first two rural communities to do that, is if you are fully vaccinated two weeks post completion of the course, you can bypass the quarantine and testing requirements in those local communities. Yukiavik has not uh, taken that step. Um, from a, a tribal health perspective, we really respect the local decision-making on when uh, 
what we follow the local rules, mm -hmm. no matter when we travel people out uh, to the rural communities. But there is a, a start in that direction uh, related to that question. And separately, there was a question related to Yukiavik's uh, immunization rate. The, the state of Alaska's website on the vaccine provides some degree of um, the immunization rates, but it's really bro broken down by borough or census area. So it's North Slope Borough, which uh, I think was uh, Dr. Rackett commented in the 34% range. But uh, in tribal health, we have a little bit uh, better visibility into uh, the areas uh, served by Arctic Slope Native uh, Association, which includes Yukiavik, but uh, also the com communities of Point Lay, Wainwright, Nuiksik, Katovic. Um, and those communities, I, I think overall for first back, first dose vaccine are over 50%. Um, so there is a higher um, immunization rate in Yukiavik than when what you look at the whole North Slope borough. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Andres. I appreciate that comment. I, I also just want to emphasize that we look at all the different factors surrounding the activity as well. So for most folks going to Yavik for research, they're in a communal living situation with you know, shared use of, of a kitchen, uh, things like that. And so all those factors uh, are considered in, a, in the evaluation of when and how we might consider uh, relaxing policy. Thank you, Frank. Um, well, I think that we've um, come to the close of this hour. Um, and so I'd like to thank each of the panelists for sharing today. Um, we are going to um, put a link for our breakout sessions in the chat. Um, and so when you sign into the new Zoom link for the breakout sessions, um, we'll ask you to um, put a, a number um, and the number of instructions will be at the, the new Zoom breakout group and of um, which uh, session you'd like to join. I think we have um, research in Arctic communities, Alaska-based research and logistics, um, international uh, research and then discussions with the National Science Foundation. And so um, we'd ask that you click on the link and change the, uh, the, uh, um, your, your, the number behind your name. And then um, we'll take a 10 minute break and then we'll rejoin the breakout groups. And it looks like the link is now in the chat for, for everyone to, uh, to, to go to the breakout room. So thank you once again to all the panelists and we'll see you after, um, we'll see you at the new meeting.